Encouraged by the defeat of Coptic Egypt by the forces of Islam and aware of Aksum's own weakened state, Judith's army entered and destroyed the city of Aksum. An ancient Ethiopian manuscript gives this account of her victory. First, she destroyed the palace and church built by Ibraha. Then the stelae, which were constructed by the Greek craftsmen, were broken by her hammers. Judith ruled for 40 years. In the wake of Judith's rule, a new Jewish dynasty called Zagwe took the reins of Ethiopia's power in the 10th century AD. The explorer James Bruce wrote that the first five Zagwan kings were Jewish. They traced their nobility directly to Moses and his Ethiopian wife. After the Zagwe relinquished control of the throne to their Christian relations, the Jewish Ethiopians maintained their own independent kingdom in the Ethiopian highlands. Not until the 16th century did the Falashas begin to lose their hard-won independence. The Christian Ethiopian kings, fortified with Portuguese firearms and infused with the murderous spirit of the Inquisition brought by Jesuit missionaries, began to overwhelm the Jews. In a last terrifying battle, the Jewish king Gideon chose death rather than to submit to baptism. Eventually, a backlash against the Jesuits led by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church saw to the execution and banishment of the Portuguese missionaries who almost succeeded in destroying both the Jews and the native Ethiopian church. Regardless, the Falashas received a crippling blow to their economic and political independence, a blow from which they would never recover. By the time James Bruce arrived in the late 1700s, the Jewish population had declined to less than half a million people. With the accession of King Theodore to the throne in the mid-1800s, Ethiopia gained its greatest ruler since Caleb. Theodore subdued his rivals and united the country under his strong centralized rule. The Ethiopian Jews saw Theodore's success as a prelude to the coming of the Messiah, and led by some of their religious leaders, they attempted to emigrate to Palestine, decades before the birth of Zionism in Europe. Sadly, their dream ended in disease and starvation. Also during Theodore's reign, Henry Stern and other Protestant missionaries based in London devoted themselves to converting Ethiopia's Jews to Christianity. Stern told the Falashas that Judaism was a dead religion and the Jews of the world had accepted Christianity. Stern was eventually imprisoned by Theodore when he gravely insulted the emperor during a royal audience. A British army was sent to rescue Stern and his fellow missionaries. General Napier led the English expeditionary army that defeated Theodore at the Battle of Magdala, where Theodore took his own life rather than face the disgrace of capture. By the time Haile Selassie had gained the Ethiopian throne, pro falasha committees headed by Fetlovich had succeeded in establishing schools for the Falashas. Selassie, known as the Lion of Judah, was 225th successor to the Ethiopian crown. Across the Mediterranean, Benito Mussolini, fascist dictator of Italy, dreamed of restoring the Roman Empire to its former glory. Mussolini coveted Ethiopia's fertile plains and its position straddling the Red Sea. Enthusiastically supported by legions of black-shirted fascists, he launched an all-out invasion of Africa's only independent country. By 1939, over 200 planes, 10,000 military vehicles, and 200,000 men were dispatched to make Ethiopia the jewel of the Italian Empire in Africa. The Italians had invaded Ethiopia in the 1890s, only to be defeated in the Battle of Adawa. Now they returned with a vengeance, using the most modern of weapons. With their initial success, the invaders attempted to lure the Falashas and other tribal groups into collaborating against the dominant Amharic tribe. But the Falashas rallied to their country's defense, and as one observer wrote, 
Kushites, the dominant race, were to be seen drilling besides Palasha Jews, Galas, and Somalis. After Mussolini signed a 1938 treaty with Hitler, the Ethiopian Jews became a direct target of anti-Semitic propaganda. Ironically, this makes the Falashas the first Jews to take up arms against fascism, and the first Jews outside Germany and Italy to suffer directly from the hatred of Nazism. During the course of the war, the Ethiopian royal family went into exile, with Haile Selassie staying in Jerusalem before heading to London. Only after years of fighting with the Ethiopians with the help of the British and a small contingent of Palestinian Jews, able to throw the Italian invasionary force from Ethiopia. <laughs> The war seriously disrupted the fabric of Ethiopian Jewish life. In its aftermath, the people clung to their traditional crafts. But the combination of missionary work and economic exploitation over the decades had decimated the population. This woman is preparing some of the distinctive dark Ethiopian clay for pottery work. The Falasha women do not use the potter's wheel in their labors, and the items they produce are highly prized articles of Ethiopian life. The men operate handmade looms that weave cotton thread into cloth. <laughs> These women are demonstrating the age-old technique of spinning cotton fiber into thread. The shama is the traditional garb of all Ethiopians. The closely knit Ethiopian Jewish community is strongly held together by the people's deep spiritual faith. Throughout the centuries, they have steadfastly defended the religion of their ancestors and have strictly observed the commandments of the Torah. The weekly Sabbath ceremony is a keystone of their religion, and the Falashas believe that nothing can vie in its importance to the human soul. Ethiopian Judaism has evolved greatly in the past four decades. The greatest innovation has been the introduction of Hebrew into Falasha society and ritual. The teaching of Hebrew is today banned in Ethiopia, and numerous Hebrew teachers have been tortured and killed for their efforts. These Kesses are chanting Laho Dao Di, let us receive the Sabbath. The intonation is Ethiopian, but the words are in Hebrew. Another important theme in the prayers of the Falashas concerns the redemption of Israel. One prayer reads, Do not separate me, O Lord, from the chosen, from the light, from the splendor. Let me see, O Lord, the light of Israel, and put me with thy people, Israel.
Now, in our time, countless centuries of prayer and supplication have been answered. For out of the ruins of the Holocaust, the event of the millennia took place. October 1947. Two shiploads of Jewish refugees from Europe attempt to land in Palestine, only to be turned away by the British and shipped to internment on Cyprus. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa in the first of a series of battles that were to reverberate through the years. In the year of independence, fighting was fierce in the Negev desert area. Here, Israeli troops routed the Arabs and took hundreds of prisoners. Meanwhile, on May 14, 1948, the new government, headed by David Ben-Gurion, is installed in Tel Aviv. Thus, for the first time since the Roman legion destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 A.D., the Jewish people have a nation of their own. Thus, history was made as the Jewish state of Israel was born. Conceived in strife and weaned on violence, Israel has flourished to become a constructive voice in world affairs. Her flag became a symbol of hope in a troubled world. That day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. That day, the Lord will raise his hand once more to ransom the remnant of his people, left over from the exile of Assyria, of Egypt, of Pathros, of Ethiopia. He will hoist a signal for the nations and assemble the outcasts of Israel. He will bring back the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The Lord will have pity on Jacob. He will choose Israel once more and settle them in their own country. Thus says the Lord, at a favorable time, I will answer you. On the day of salvation, I will help you. I have formed you and appointed you a covenant of the people. I will say to the prisoners, come out. To those in darkness, show yourself. Yes, I am going to gather all Jacob together, like sheep in the fold, like a flock in its pasture. They will fear no man. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my supplicants will bring me offerings. I shall rescue them from wherever they have been scattered, during the mist and darkness. I shall bring them out of the countries where they are. I will plant them in their own country, never to be rooted out again of the land. To you, daughter of Zion, the hopeful captives will return. And the gain of Ethiopia, men of stature, shall come unto you and shall be yours.